data presentation the objective of the video is to introduce to you to some ways to present data and what are the definitions when to use these graphs and of course some indications on what misleading graphs are so we have different types of data presentation. We can have verbal, we have tabular and semi-tabular. So verbal, if we only use words to describe what the data what the data is about, and then if we use tables like Excel table or the frequency distribution, that would be under tabular representation. If we use the two types, which is verbal and tabular, then we call it semi-tabular representation. The most common ways to present information in statistics is through graphs. And in graphs, we, as a reader, you can draw information, conclusions out of the uh, graph. So in, in fact, we make in, uh, an analysis, uh, interpretations, just by looking at numbers that are very vivid to you as a reader. Now, we have different ways to use graphs depending on the type of variables it presents. For instance, if we have quantitative variables, we may use the following graphs. And they're quantitative variables which are grouped. First, we have histogram. We also have frequency polygon and ogive. So what is a uh, histogram? It's, it is as how it's being presented. Um, it's uh, made through uh, using the frequencies and the frequency distribution and the class boundaries. It's also um, uh, the, the, the description of the graph is when we use vertical bars that are contiguous. When you say contiguous, these graphs are connected with each others with each other. It is um, just like this. Uh, it's there's no space in between. The second type of graph is what we call the frequency polygon. Um, from the word polygon, you're expected to create a shape here by just connecting the dots of the, uh, which these dots are the frequencies of each class midpoint. And um, because there are high, so it should be close to create a polygon, hence the term frequency polygon. The last one is ogive. Ogive is like a timeline, a time graph, timeline, where you still connect the midpoints of um, the data sets. However, instead of using just the midpoint in here, um, you also use the uh, the the frequencies as well and then you connect the graphs or the cumulative frequencies the other one a while ago was just simply using the regular frequency while here we are going to use cumulative frequency so that's why it's also known as cumulative frequency graph now we also have graphs for categorical variables so these types of variables are often discrete data and the first one is very known. We have bar graph, and it's like uh, the histogram. It also uses vertical and sometimes horizontal bars, and uh, it re um, represents the frequencies of the data under categorical. So notice these are the representation. We have here the horizontal bar graph and the vertical bar graph frequencies are on the side this is um, usually indicated by your y-axis for vertical graph and then the x-axis for the horizontal graph next one we have Pareto chart Pareto chart is like bar graph not really that different in terms of uh, presentation um, it still uses the frequencies of the variables that there is in the like Atlanta, Chicago, Washington, Baltimore, St. Louis, cities. Uh, it, uh, the, this is where the frequencies are located along the y-axis. Um, 
However, um, for Bargak, they are just gas according to how they are. There's no specific requirement like arrangement. In Pareto chart, your graphs or vertical graphs should be arranged from highest to lowest. Hence, uh, you are forming like a staircase here because that is a requirement. How do we make this? Um, you also need to ensure that your Pareto chart have the same width in terms of bars. And again, it's arranged from largest to smallest. And we use equal sizes of frequencies. Of course, best used for nominal or qualitative variables. We also have time series. And then in time series, this is how it looks like. Uh, we are using the frequencies, of course, and then we try to connect the dots. And this is when we would like to actually show a pattern or a trend. Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? You may also compare two categories, men and women, for instance, depending on the year. The time series is the best option if you would like to show um, trend or pattern for a specific period of time. Pi graph, on the other hand, is a representation of data sets using a circle that represents 100%. And the circle will be divided into several parts indicating the the the, the number of each category. So in here, suppose the categories are the snaps presented, and then they are converted into percentage, and so we have percentage distribution. So the entire circle is equivalent to 100%. Of course, its purpose is to show relationship between the parts and the whole. And by the way, before I proceed, let's go back a little to bar graph, histogram, and Pareto chart, and how are they different from each other? You have to remember, in histogram, the data sets, or the, the, the vertical graphs are contiguous. However, they are not arranged, so it doesn't matter. There are also instances where uh, if there's no frequency, then you leave the space blank. That's for histogram. For bar graph, there is a space between each bars. So you have to remember the spaces. And then for Pareto chart, um, there is no space. It's contiguous. However, there is an arrangement of uh, the frequency. So whoever has the highest frequency should be first on the left side part. You're aiming to create a stairway type staircase, however you prefer to call it, in creating the Pareto chart. Now let's proceed to other types of graphs. We also have box plot, and the importance of this type of presentation is to see whether our distribution is normal. Let me say normal. This is when there is no outlier. Outlier are numbers that are not really along the norm the norm reference so we would like to see if um, these are outliers or extreme values are present suppose um, if majority of the people is along the the salary of let's just say 15000 pesos and then there's somebody who's earning 2000 a month, that person who's earning 2000 a month is an outlier in comparison to the 15,000 people. So this should be seen in the box plot. And the importance of having this graph first before you proceed to further analysis or uh, identifying any statistical tools you're going to use is that you are aware if the, a certain distribution has an outlier or an extreme value. Next, scatter plot. 
scatter plots are often used to show, of course, the relationship between two variables. So if your statistic file analysis is more likely correlation, regression, you are expected to present a scatter plot to actually show how the trend of the relationship of the two variables are being shown. So you can see there whether it's increasing, decreasing, or does it have a neutral trend, whatever. So most likely, if your research is correlate correlation, then you will you will likely have a scatter plot. Stem and leaf plots. These are used to just simply um, group together values according to their, I mean, just simply grouping. For instance, these are your first digits on the left side, and these are your, uh, I mean, tens, tens digits on the left side, and these are your ones digit. So uh, if you are to group, suppose it's on 31, 32, and so on. So these are how they're in a group. Um, this is important if you would just like to see how many are in a certain, let's just say, how many are under 10 or, or under 20 or above 10, above 20, and so on. Next, misleading graphs. So not all graphs are something to believe in immediately once you see them. As I mentioned in some of our discussions, graphs or statistics in general is sometimes used to mislead people because you know um, when you have research however sophisticated the process of your research is we have to know that only the final results of your study will be relayed to the majority of the people and the people normal people will just be reading the graph and depending on the intention of the researchers or the one who's reporting the results, they can use, uh, they can do something to mislead the the readers of the information. Hence, uh, we have to be careful when not to uh, use, when, when not to do this and that. So these are some of the indications of a misleading graph. Uh, for instance, if we the, just decide to reduce the scale of the presentation. When I say scale, um, the y-axis of the graph, this is what you're seeing on the left part, is representing the frequencies of each category or data set. Uh, I mean data. Now, notice how we compare a graph that is only showing 95 to 100% of the distribution while this one is showing the 0 to 100% distribution. At first glance, it seemed like the left graph is showing us a very varied difference in terms of height. Because as you can see, we really are seeing a staircase here with certain gaps. So we can easily say that manufacturers Automobile, um, I mean, manufacturers' automobile is higher. Yes, it is higher, but if we look at the general graph where it shows the zero to 100 percent, it doesn't really, it doesn't seem like the difference is that big in comparison to the original graph. So this one is um, trying to mislead the readers of the information that there is really a big gap between manufacturers automobiles competitors one automobile and competitor to automobile so it but in reality the margin of difference is just very small not very significant to actually say that there is a difference next notice how the um, timeline here is being made. It seemed like there is really an increase, significant increase in the the frequency on the right side. However, if you look at the left side, it doesn't seem like there is a significant movement or increase. 
notice on the scale on the left side is 0 to 25 while the scale on the right side is just simply from 20 to 24 which is still misleading so the left side is telling us that there is no no difference really not significant there is no significant increase while the other one is telling us that there is likely a significant increase in the years presented, which is, again, misleading. So if you would like to really have a positive impact, you would have chosen the right graph, which is um, supposedly not. Next, we have here the, the, the aesthetic presentation of a graph. I have made an example of this one, the, the one where, where there is a comparison of height. But notice, um, our brain perceives shape differently. So if there, if notice here, we know that 1967 is really small, but uh, and 2010 is the leading turning, I mean, uh, has a um, cost of, has a higher cost in terms of 19, uh, in comparison to 1967. But we do understand that, the, I mean, it's justified because the graph that we are using a graph that is just of equivalent width in comparison to a circle here. It seems like it's very massive, like super massive level increase because um, again, our brain perceives shape differently. So if you prefer to show it to, to actually insist that 2010 has a very high, large cost over 1967, you would have relayed the message well, but then in, in, in other contexts, that would have been um, interpreted differently. So let's not use aesthetics over um, presenting the graph as standard as it could be. Another one is when the graphs are presented without units like frequencies or no proper labeling. Yes, this is how it's being presented, but what is an ESW and how what are the the, the heights of these vertical gaps? I mean bars. Cost of living, economic growth, population growth, time rate, are these being measured in the same manner in the same standard are we are we believe uh, are we led to believe that these vertical lines are the same what if not what if the frequencies are different from among each of these um variables here so this is still a misleading graph so we have to be careful to to as a reader we have to be careful to actually see if the graphs that are presented to us lack something or confusing or just because omitting a certain information in the graph is already a form of cheating or i mean uh, you are already trying to mislead whether it be intentional or not and as a researcher we also have to be careful in presenting our data we have to make sure that we present it as hundred per in terms of scaling they should be presented from zero to hundred percent scale and in terms of labeling we have to properly label them we have to show the frequency so that we will not have implied interpretations of the data sets or whatever is being presented in the graph um, the, the risk there is we might create our own interpretation and uh, that would some that is not something that we would intend to do when we present the results of our researches. Thank you.